Cape Chronicle. I'm Jacob McClellan. On today, we'll talk with Southeast Missouri State University head baseball coach Steve Beezer about the upcoming baseball season. Cape Girardeau Assistant City Manager Molly Hood will discuss the Transportation Trust Fund, and we'll talk about community outreach with the Cape Girardeau Police Department's Darren Hickey. That's all ahead on Cape Chronicle. Stay tuned. This is your beginning. The entire world is before you. Every opportunity is yours. Make the most of it. Cape Chronicle, I'm Jacob McClellan. It's time for another season of Red Hawks baseball here in Cape Girardeau. Our first guest today is Southeast Missouri State University's head baseball coach, Steve Beezer. Thank you so much for coming by to talk with us. Well, thanks, Jacob, for having us. Now, before your, your career as a, as a, as a coach, um, you actually played Major League Baseball. You had a, a couple of seasons with the, with the Mets and the Pirates. So I just first thing I just have to ask, what was it like stepping into the batter's box that first time that you had a chance to, uh, to play at the Major League level? Well, I remember that time very well. It was uh, opening day in, in San Diego. And, uh, you know, I think the biggest highlight that I can remember, it, it took me eight years of minor league baseball. So I was climbing through the minor league ranks. And, and uh, as a late, late round draft pick, typically you're a roster filler in the minor leagues and, and just kept plugging away and eventually got my opportunity. Uh, Bobby Valentine was our manager for the New York Mets. And, the, and we were playing against him. The, the, the previous season in AAA, and I had a, I had a really good year that year, and and tend to hurt them quite a bit. So he took me on the, on the major league roster out of spring training. But you know the highlight of that was just remembering opening day when they read the the rosters out and you line up on the foul line, and and uh, you know the guys on 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 the New York Mets I had already got to know, but the the team that we were playing, you know, was you had Ricky Henderson leading off, and you had Tony Gwynn hitting in their three hole, and just. You know, that, that was just an unbelievable experience, and, and it's something that, you know, you'll never forget that type of experience of getting an opportunity to play Major League Baseball and, and just, you know, very fortunate. You mentioned that it took you uh, eight years uh, playing in the, in the minors before you got that first, that, that first chance in the, in the Major Leagues. How, did, how does that experience of, of, of spending that much time of working and, and going through the minors, how does that influence you today as a, you know, like as a, as a, as a coach of, of, of collegiate baseball? Well, I, th I think uh, that's had a very positive impact on me as a coach because uh, the hard work that it takes to get to that level and just the perseverance and, and, and kind of trying to, to relay that to our players that, that you know, it, it, there's, we shouldn't set limits on ourselves, that we need to keep working towards our goals and, and really push to be the best that we can be. And, and uh, there was a lot of trying times in, in, during that uh, of, of kind of going through because I was a 32nd round draft pick out of Southeast Missouri State and nobody expected to, to really do much. And uh, you know, each year there's a new draft class coming in and those guys that were selected in higher rounds, you know, I, I, I told our players one day, I said, I don't know if I've ever started a season off in, in pro ball that I was a, an everyday player to, from the start of the season. But one of the things that I kind of took pride in by the end of the season, I was an everyday player. And it's just, it's just having that perseverance and and knowing that if, if you continue to get out there and do your best, that eventually good things will happen. And, and that's really a lot what we talk about in our program is just trying to get players to constantly go out and, and strive to be the best that they can be and not worry about the situations around them right you know, at that point because, because things really do change. Well, let's talk a little bit about your, the program and the culture that's, that's been fostered here uh, in the baseball program at Southeast, uh, and particularly the academics, because um, traditionally the, the baseball club um, has always had one of the highest grade point averages among uh, uh, Ohio Valley Conference teams, correct? Correct, and that's something that, you know, that, that was here before I got here, but it's definitely something that I didn't want to see uh, go by the wayside. And when, when we talk culture with, with our guys, it, it's, we're trying to build champions, and it's not just uh, in baseball. We're trying to, to make it a lifelong uh, thing for, for every one of our players, both on the field and off the field. And, 
and uh, we we really stick to you know, it, it. It's kind of cliche, but you know we're we're talking about being committed to excellence in everything that we do. You know, from from the baseball diamond to the classroom uh, to service in the community, and those are really the the three things that I talk and I have some influence with our players about because you know it, our, our four like broad pillars there are really faith, family, education, and service, and they know exactly what those things mean, but. Me as a coach, it's kind of you know from the faith and family side. Really, the only way, only thing that they can derive from me is to see the way that I that I walk uh, in my life, and and that's something that that I hope that they're they're paying attention to. And and from what I know from having many coaches, is I typically I I retain the things that I see my coach do more so than the things that he tells me to do. So that's very important. But the things that I feel that as a coaching staff that we have a major impact on. On these guys is really the it, it's it is the education we can control the education because uh, it's expected that our players go to class every single day and and that's just part of, of being committed to to the excellence part you got to get to class you got to do uh, your best in the class and and then from a baseball educational standpoint I think it's my job to make sure that our players have the best baseball education and and that's something that I, that I I promise my players that they will have that you will have the best baseball education if you're willing to soak up everything that we're giving you every day. Uh, you know we've got a I've got an outstanding coaching staff that just uh, and Coach Rhodes and Coach Lawson that really have taken ownership of of the the vision that that I set out there and they do a really good job of following through on all the things that that we're talking about. But we just kind of call it our ABCs: it's academics, it's baseball, and it's it's community service. Uh, and, and the community service component is really crucial for us because I feel, you know, what, what we want is we want a bunch of team, we want players to be teammates, not just worried about what they're doing for themselves. But when we get out in a community and, and we're doing community service, it's just, it, it, and we translate that and we talk about how are you serving the guy that's hitting in the lineup behind you? How are you, when you come in in the middle of an inning, how are you serving that guy that just, just got taken out for you to come in? And, and it's really kind of getting that team atmosphere going and and those you know the ABC's I think really it sticks to our players because academically we've, we we continue to achieve each semester we we've, we've continued to raise up our GPA and uh, you know we're we're just committed to excellence and striving for more and, and and you know we know we're not gonna attain to perfection but we do feel that that we are going to to do the best that we can do as an individual well you had a, a great year last year you uh, finished 23 and 7 won the Ohio Valley Conference uh, regular season title what really gelled with last year's teams what were the what were the strengths that really that really came through well I think it was the buy-in from our players I mean obviously uh, when when you have that type of season it, it's it people have bought into what you're trying to sell uh, but again it's it's the uh, it's getting the right type of people in our program and that and that 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 took some time I mean we had we had a, a little hiccup there I think you know when when there was a coaching change when I came in as an assistant coach there was a tremendous demand on we needed 18 players uh, that season and, and we saw a little downslide uh, because uh, when the original coach left we, we, need, we when I came in in August as a recruiting coordinator we still we were way behind in the recru recruiting trail and and I you know not not I think all those guys that we brought in were, were fantastic guys but we were behind in the recruiting side and so getting the right type of players in our programs number one and and once we got those guys we've got to be able to convince them and buy into what we're selling and and that group last year uh, it all came together we had great uh, leadership from our team uh, and I think anytime you've got that leadership in a locker room and a locker room is getting along well things just keep you know we, w we went from being predict we were predicted to finish sixth in the conference uh, and and we won it by five games and and there were some really good teams going in the, in the season in our conference that you know, realistically, I thought it, it would be nice to finish in the top three with what we had, but everything came together, things fell into place, and, and we were injury free, so that, that was very crucial in last season. Let's get a, a quick update on some of the, some of the former Red Hawks that are, that are playing professional ball now. We know Shea Simmons is pitching for the, for the Atlanta Braves. We also have Derek Gibson and Matt Teller. How, how are those guys faring right now? Well, that, I think they're doing very well. I mean, obviously, Shea Simmons' story is just, uh, it, to me, it's an incredible story because I, when he got drafted, I knew exactly how tough the road ahead for him was going to be. He was a late round pick, 22nd round pick, and, and one of the biggest things he had going against him was size. I mean, he was a right-handed pitcher that was 5'11", 185 pounds somewhere, and usually the stereotype is those guys are going to break down quickly. They'll never get to the big leagues, uh, and they're just there to fill a roster. But 
within it within a year and a half the guys in the big leagues and dominating but you know and it, and it's all on him because he he just flew through their minor league system and just dominated at every level they gave him an opportunity to uh, he continued to progress as a player from when he left here uh, but Shea was when Shea was here Shea was always a hard worker and uh, you, you knew that that was going to eventually uh, whenever he got everything lined out and it became it became a job is just a, you know a, a hobby or a passion of his when it became serious he really locked in and got very dedicated to his sport and uh, he made that huge jump in a, in a very rapid time and you in looking at his big league numbers from last year that that's incredible that a guy can come up and and uh, and do what he did that quick and but we all know it at, at that level the toughest thing is to repeat it and go back through the league a second and third time, and that's what he's getting ready to do this year. Well, Coach, I hate to uh, I hate to cut you off here, but we're out of time, and I really do appreciate you coming by to talk with us today. Well, thank you. We've been talking with Steve Beezer. He is Southeast Missouri State University's head baseball coach. Ahead, Cape Girardeau's Transportation Trust Fund. That's coming up on Cape Chronicle. social change. They fought against tyrants. They fought for human rights. Yet behind these achievements are individuals who waged a more personal war. They fought the struggle against mental illness. And they won. Good one, son. Last summer, my new dad took me on vacation. <laughs> First, we went oh. deep sea fishing. Wow! I'm so proud of you, son. And then we went on thunder shark. <laughs> that was awesome! Let's go again! Three times. <laughs> I gotta say, it was pretty cool. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Oh, not again. The gum tree, cardiac hill, and countless traditions that will make you proud to be a Red Hawk. Or just gross you out. What are you waiting for? Schedule your visit today. Welcome back to Cape Chronicle. Cape Charter voters approved the first transportation trust fund in 1995. The city is working on the final projects of its fourth transportation trust fund, or TTF, which funds road improvement projects on a pay-as-you-go basis. Samantha Reinhardt of the Southeast Missouri newspaper spoke to Cape Girardeau Assistant City Manager Molly Hood about the upcoming renewal of TTF and what TTF 5 might bring to Cape Girardeau residents. Thank you, Molly, for coming here today to talk to us about TTF. And this is something that the city of Cape Girardeau has really used as a primary resource to take care of infrastructure needs and transportation needs. And this is something that started way back in 1995, but is still continued today and is coming up on a recent renewal. So talk a little bit about the history of TTF and some of the biggest things it's done for Cape Girardeau. Absolutely. A TTF, or Transportation Trust Fund, is a half cent sales tax that commenced in 1995. The voters of Cape Girardeau have renewed that every five years since then. Um, in the last 20 years, it has generated approximately $80 million in revenue for transportation projects. Mm -hmm. And with that funding, we've been able to accomplish a multitude of transportation projects in every corner of the city. Some of those projects have included the Broadway improvements downtown, Seamers Drive, Veterans Memorial Drive, LaSalle, Big Bend, I mean, and on and on and on. So right. we've really been able to accomplish a lot. And we are coming up on the fifth installment here. In January, a group, a committee went to the council and gave this presentation of some initial projects. Um, I believe about eight were on the list and you have four alternates and then of course general maintenance needs. Mm -hmm. And this is just a little bit different from the past because this is very much focused on maintaining infrastructure. 
That's correct. In the past uh, TTFs, we've had projects that have expanded CAPE's transportation system. This time around, we need to really focus on preserving our existing transportation system. So the projects that you will see on the recommended project list will focus more on rehabilitation and reconstruction of our existing streets. Um, we're also looking at taking a bigger proportion of the TTF revenue and using it for pavement management, so asphalt overlay and concrete repair. So it is definitely a little bit different, but it's kind of like with your house, you'd love to have that shiny new kitchen or bathroom, but if you don't take care of the foundation of the house, it, nothing else really matters. Right. You know, that's whatever your infrastructure needs, TTF seems to be there for it. And sometimes that is expansion, and sometimes that is really just making sure what you've got is up to the standards. Absolutely. So one thing that is going to stay the same with this renewal is the idea of voter input. You know, from beginning to end, the public has this opportunity to come in and kind of weigh in on the projects. Um, we do have this list that was presented to council, mm -hmm. but this list isn't, it's not definite yet. People still very much have a chance to weigh in here. Absolutely, and we will have some public meetings coming up. Just to backtrack a little bit so you know how the list was generated, the TTF committee, which was comprised of some of our planning and zoning commission members and a few citizen members, looked at several different criteria to generate that list. Those criteria included things like connectivity, um, safety, economic development, um, and they scored all of those projects and presented a list to the city council. Um, that's a good starting point, but we definitely do want the public to weigh in and give us their input on those. And so we will be having public meetings. Uh, the first of those was, will be Monday, February 23rd at City Hall, and we will have another one March 3rd, location to be determined, but we will have all that information available on the city website. And the city website is a good resource to, in this week upcoming, you know, looking at maps and the projects. And so when you go to these meetings, you have this understanding of, okay, this is what I'm looking at. This is what's going to be coming my way. Absolutely. On the website, we will have maps of all the past TTF projects. So you can see everything that's been accomplished to date over the last 20 years, including projects that we currently have underway. Uh, that were left over from TTF-4, and then we will have a map of the proposed TTF-5 projects. Um, we will also um, have information about the recommended list from the committee, as well as some additional information about pavement management. Okay. So looking at this idea of maintenance, I think some people have said, oh, you know, it's hard to get excited about maintenance because new projects are shiny and they're great, but when it comes to you know driving across the same cracks in your pavement every day, maintenance kind of becomes more of an attractive idea. Absolutely, and I think last winter was extremely hard on this city. Um, the repairs from last winter alone equate to about $2 million worth of repair, which is substantial, and that, that hits a lot of our neighborhood roads yeah. too. And that's the other thing, a lot of the money that we've invested in our system has been on the major arterial roads, um, Kings Highway and Mount Auburn, and William and streets like that, that people travel on a regular basis. But a lot of our neighborhood roads and local collectors um, have taken a serious beating due to the weather and just age. And so those are things that need to be addressed. And you know, if you have one of those neighborhood streets that has significant potholing or cracking, mm -hmm. you're definitely impacted by it. And that's another thing that this TTF, you know, while it does stand out a little bit because of this maintenance theme, you know, it's also similar to others in that you're going to see it around the city. It's not like just one area is going to get attention. This is everywhere. This is for all kinds of neighborhoods that have need. Absolutely. And um, we've tried to look at some of those projects that are going to impact people the most. One of the projects that I think everybody is affected by is uh, independence between Rodney or Gordonville and Carruthers. And so we have a lot of retail in there. We have a lot of curb cuts, a lot of different traffic movements. Anyone who's gone through that intersection during a busy time of day has experienced that congestion. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we'd like to try to address. So we try to identify corridors that impact a significant amount of people. And we do try to hit various areas of the city. And again, that goes back to that committee. That was something that when they presented to council said, we come from different parts of the city, so we know where all of the biggest areas of need are. And that's something that I think you really see the benefits from when it comes down to this part of TTF. Mm -hmm. That's definitely true. Um, that's one of the things they talked about in their committee meetings is they thought about wh where do we drive every day and, and encounter these the congested areas and safety issues. And that was definitely a contributing factor in their recommendation to council. So I think the city's in a pretty good position now to go forward with these ideas. You, know, you guys are really ready to bring this to the people and 
when you get these questions because inevitably people really want to know where is my money going and what is it doing and that's something that TTF has a strong history of of showing you exactly this is where it's gone this is where it's going yeah and if everybody comes out to our public meetings we're actually going to have a little interactive um, exercise where people will actually be given money and can and put their money where their mouth is and decide what projects they would spend the money on. So we're excited for people to come out. Is that something that's been done before or is that kind of a new venture? Not that I'm aware of in CAPE. I know other communities have used that um, interactive model, so we'll see how it works. <laughs> well, again, I think transparency is everything when it comes to taxpayer money. So I think people appreciate things like that and you know, kind of that creativity when it comes to showing you this is what we're doing here. So. Well, we get excited about it, and we want other people to get excited about it, too. So right. that's, that's part of our goal. Well, Transportation Trust Fund just continues to be something really big for the city and something really big for the voters. You know, having it renewed every five years since 1995 is not really a small accomplishment. Mm -hmm. So, again, February will be the first meeting. February 23rd. And then that will follow on into March. So thank you for coming in and talking about this and letting everybody know their next steps for TTF. I appreciate it. Thank you, Samantha. Starbucks, Chick-fil-A, Subway, and thousands of other options for breakfast, dinner, and in between. What are you waiting for? Schedule your visit today. Cape Chronicle, I'm Jacob McClellan. The Cape Charter Police Department has several programs to help community outreach efforts. Here to talk about these programs and more is police spokesperson Darren Hickey. Thank you so much for coming by. Thanks for having me. Well, first, let's just talk a little bit about uh, um, some of the community outreach programs that you have going on in Cape Charter, including the uh, the Coffee with Cops program. This has been very successful so far. Um, what, what's, what, are you, what are you guys looking for in, in having these types of programs where people can come by and, and meet some police officers on a, on a given morning? It's all about interaction. It's all about getting to know the people that are in our community and the community getting to know us and trust us. Um, you know, we live here too. This is our community. We have as much vie in, in safety and, and community involvement as, as somebody that's not a police officer. So we want people to understand that. We want to educate people on what we can and what we can't do. Uh, a lot of times people get frustrated with law enforcement because they feel like there wasn't a satisfaction. Maybe because we couldn't do something. So a lot of part of, a uh, big part of law enforcement is education. And so many platforms for law enforcement is uh, very stricted and very um, delegated in speeches and agendas. And, and so we're trying to create a platform of interaction. Uh, very open-ended, you know, just come and say hi, ask a question and just get to know us. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the confidential tip line that you that you started um, in the last couple of months or so. Mm -hmm. Has has that has that been has that paid off so far? Absolutely. You know, any time that somebody has an avenue where they wouldn't normally contact us, that they have this new avenue, we, we've seen lots of tips come in. Uh, within the first week that we opened the anonymous phone tip line, uh, we received a call and were able to make an arrest uh, for drugs and weapons violations. So. Immediately, I mean, it's a it's a free line. Doesn't cost the uh, citizens or the taxpayers any money. All it was was delegation of a phone line, and we're able to make an arrest. We're still getting information daily on just you know little bits from a vehicle color to a description to, hey, this may be going on somewhere else, and and so any little piece of information when we have an investigation going on that leads to the next thing, that's always a positive aspect. And it's, and it's all anonymous? All anonymous. It's not tracked. It's not recorded. There's no phone. There's no uh, caller ID on the phone line. So it kind of gives the people, you know, that understanding, hey, I don't want retribution. I don't want anything out of this. I just want to be a good citizen. I want to be a good member of our community. And, and by having that phone line, I think it gives them an opportunity. And as I understand it, a, uh, an anonymous text line might be a uh 
uh, might be coming to Cape Girardeau pretty soon too. Yeah, we're working on that as we speak. There's a lot of dynamics and and going into texting, obviously, and we're working on an app as well, uh, so people can download the app to their smartphone and text a, a photograph or a location or any information. They can text it right to the police department, and we get that anonymously too. How has the police department been embracing social media recently to, to, to engage the community? You know, we, we're learning that that's where everything's going. And we're learning that social media is just an awesome platform for interaction. Uh, we've, we have a great response on our Facebook page as well as our Twitter account. Uh, Twitter's more instantaneous information, stuff that's going on right now. Uh, still throwing, try to throw some tips in and some safety uh, tips. But Facebook, we're doing more of our press releases and, and scam alerts. We're doing a lot of scam alerts on Facebook as well. And we're getting really good response, good interaction with people, getting messages sent back and forth to us. So it, it's just been really fantastic. Now, this isn't necessarily a community outreach thing, but, but you guys are going to start doing electronic ticketing um, pretty, pretty soon. Why, why, is that a, why is that a big step forward for the department? It's, it's all dealing with technology and, and embracing the technology for our department. And it's all just steps in the right direction to make us more efficient, which when, then in turn offers more resources and we can, we can do more for the public. And it's becoming more interactive. And that's what it's all about is embracing that technology and, and you know, being more efficient and, and taking those steps to uh, make us a better department. Let, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the citizens police experience. We only have about a minute or so left, but this is a, a, a totally different attempt to uh, to kind of show the community what what goes on for folks that that, that, that work in the police department. Yeah, we're gonna have we're gonna host a experience for citizens to come in and play the part of a police officer and experience stuff that we've experienced. Kind of show them firsthand what we have to do you know, the response time, how quick a decision has to be made. And, and it's all about education. It's all about that experience. And it's all about that relationship that we have to build with the community itself. We've been talking today with the Cape Girardeau Police Department's Darren Hickey. Darren, thank you so much for coming by to talk with us. It's I been appreciate a you having me. Thank you for joining us today for Cape Chronicle. The program is a collaboration between the Department of Mass Media at Southeast Missouri State University, the City of Cape Girardeau, and KRCU public radio station for Southeast Missouri. Our executive producer is Jim Dufek. I'm Jacob McClelland. Thanks for watching.